this is a Humanities Montana Humanities Happy Hour. So I hope that you have a beverage of your choice. I'm drinking Ooh. warm tea today, um, but you might have a glass of wine or anything like that. We, um, we want this to be kind of a fun, relaxed conversation uh, and a, a very a happy time and a happy hour. I want to start this um, program with a land acknowledgement and to say that um, we acknowledge that we are in the homelands of indigenous people, 12 tribes in Montana. We offer our respect for their history and culture and for the path they have always shown us in caring for this place for generations to come. Because we're all calling in from different places, we wanted to ask you to look at this map and I'm going to drop a link in the chat here. And you can click on that and that'll take you over to a map online. And you can type in where you're calling in from and it will show you whose traditional territory you are on. And if you could take a, a minute to do that and then drop in the chat um, where you're calling in from so we can see uh, this our geographic spread here. The map is um, a beautiful interactive site that shows indigenous territories all over the world. It's not just Montana. Um, and you can really dig into it and find a lot of information. It's an incredible resource to explore. And we hope that by finding your own place on these maps, uh, it makes the land acknowledgement of indigenous people and territories more meaningful and that you think about it throughout the happy hour today and, um, and beyond. And with that, I will turn it over to our Executive Director of Humanities Montana, Randy Tanglin, and she will introduce Heather Cahoon and lead a conversation and we'll get some, some poetry in here. Well, thank you so much for that, Samantha. And it's really great to see everyone where everyone is coming from in the chat and the homelands um, that everyone is, the native homelands that everyone is zooming in from. Thank you for leading us in that land acknowledgement, Sam. And it's great to see so many people uh, here on Zoom today. It looks like we have 57 participants so far. Um, and we welcome you to this Humanities Montana Happy Hour. And we hope that um, you will attend our other happy hours and go to our website humanitiesmontana.org and if you haven't already to sign up for our uh, to receive news from us and weekly humanities emails. I'm going to start today by introducing the wonderful Heather Cahoon who I've actually known I think we've known each other for almost 20 years dare I say that when we, uh, from attending graduate school together here at the University of Montana. Today, Dr. Heather Cahoon is going to read from her new collection of poetry, Horsefly Dress, published by the University of Arizona Press. And here it is for, for those of you who haven't seen it yet. Along with being an accomplished and widely published poet, Heather is also an assistant professor at the University of Montana where she directs the American Indian Governance and Policy Institute. She has an MFA in poetry, writing, and a PhD in Native American Studies from the University of Montana. And she was the recipient of the 2015 Montana Arts Council Artist Innovation Award and a 2005 Merriam Frontier Award uh, recipient for publication of her chapbook, Elk Thirst. Heather is of the Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribes and her poems in horsefly dress incorporate Salish language and stories. And I'll, I'll let Heather talk about that more, um, especially the story of horsefly dress herself. These individual poems, it, it, it really struck me reading this collection that these individual poems and the work as a whole link the past to the present to the future. And I think that is especially powerful this month when we hear over and over again the story of Thanksgiving Day through the lens of what Nigerian novelist Chimamanda Adichie calls the single story or the danger of a single story. Horsefly dress is testimony that native life, language, and culture are not a remnant of the past, but a vital and powerful and imaginative force in the present day. Another Montana poet, Natalie Petersi, puts it this way. Horsefly dress connects the brutality and hope of the past and the future through memories, dreams, visions, and, me and mediations. 
Heather, congratulations on the publications of Horsefly Dress and thank you so much for joining us today. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you, I'm really happy to be here. Um, thank you so much for that introduction. That was very nice and hi to everybody who tuned in. Um, I really appreciate it. And I'm just gonna start off with the title poem. And um, Randy, you know, asked if I could maybe say just a bit about um, Horsefly Dress, um, why this title for the book. And, um, you know, it was actually Natalie, a conversation at the playground <laughs> of all places. <laughs> we had our kids there one day and we were talking about um, my work and she said, you know, that would make an amazing title for, for the book. Um, a lot of the poems were actually already focused on her. Um, and some of the backstory um, as how I came to, um, how I encountered horsefly dress in the stories. Um, it was several years ago and, you know, it just in passing, I heard, I heard of Chattanooks. And, um, you know, so that's, that's horsefly dress in Salish. And, and I immediately was struck because I hadn't realized that Coyote had a daughter. And I, I don't know how I didn't know that all these years. I mean, I hadn't really been exposed to um, sort of the extent of our um, stories, but I had heard a lot and um, I had just never heard of her. And so immediately I became intrigued. Um, I thought not only is that just a beautiful and intriguing name, but I mean, the daughter of Coyote, like, who is she? Is she like him? Is she like Pulia, her mom? Is she, you know, like, who is this person? Who is this thing? And, um, and, and I began to seek her out in the stories. And so I, I feel like over the course of two or three years, I had read more, more of our stories than ever before. And I had listened to more of our stories than ever before. And um, finally started to you know, to get a really clear picture of who she was, but also like how the stories function. They're, what they do, they document, but they also provide insight and advice into especially suffering, this, this universal um, experience that we have and that we go through and how we can navigate through that. And so, um, so I focused on that aspect of it to just visit some instances of suffering in my own life, in the life of my family or my broader tribal community to, to really just visit those instances um, and then try to you know, work as I worked through the collection. Um, it, it goes from those instances, pulls in some of the stories and some of that, um, some of that advice, um, some of that wisdom to end with rebirth. So that's a little bit about the book and horsefly dress. And, um, and I'll just start by reading the first poem, Horsefly Dress. A long wing feather propels the stunted body of a black crowned night heron through air, breaking apart the dried mouth of memory. In an outpouring of primordial story, I hear her name, Chattanox. The hunting moon unearths Coyote's eldest and only daughter, her name no longer spoken, she turned to porous stone. But I hear her name, Chattanox, a long flathead river near Rive, in the cutting of meat, its crackle drying above smoldering cottonwood. Chattanox, at the edge of river, in passing water, the embodiment of belief, she perforates the divide between known and unknown. Here, she reconsiders the archeology span of our suffering. Her mouth opens in the alarm cry of a brown thrasher, a warning, brace for all that's wrapped into a name. So that sort of sets the context, I feel like for the rest of the poems that come after that. And the very next poem in the collection is called Nukwe, um, which means to believe. 
Why this repeated sunburst of feathered bodies, cliff swallow flocks erupt into a sky of lungs and throat a thousand dull brown wings, frantically folding, releasing, diffusing light, refracting reason, centrifugal forces decentralize until the word is scrambled, unrecognizable, uncomfortable to look at, as this history of people, skylihu and place, chiyulehu, so difficult to understand and to believe. So the next poem is called Coyote and the Cross. And um, different, different poems in here sort of contrast um, maybe a more general Christian perspective of suffering versus a, a tribal one. And um, it just like a very basic level um, suffering as, as a consequence of bad behavior <laughs> versus um, I feel like through the stories I learned that, um, you know, suffering is seen as um, a transformative experience. Um, not only can it transform you as an individual, um, but it transforms, you know, your circumstances. It can be transformative in your relationships with other people and other things. And, um, and transformation is, is seen as being sacred. I mean, it's an, it's an amazing thing. And so you have, you know, stories of um, self-inflicted or self-induced suffering, different forms. Um, fasting is considered one of those forms. Um, you know, there were different kinds of, for different tribes, different forms of sacrifice, um, certain flesh sacrifices, but certainly, you know, going without food and water and all of these different things to induce this uh, transformative power to change the future, to change circumstances, to change your psyche, to, you know, to manifest that change. So um, this poem talks about um, just some of those, those comparisons. So it's called Coyote and the Cross. One, when the West surged into the center of the world, the word pulled back into heavy honey yellow lines and scarlet patches drawn across the slight shoulders of certain blackbirds. But reality rubs raw the wounds of all stories until the scoured bones of self-evidence are all that's left. Battling inside this orbed shell of space, we find stories are no different from other living forms, the ragged haired aligned with every primal instinct to avoid demise. Consider coyote, head bone raised to greet the night, song through black tree moss like witch's hair. He delivers a message bound in the body of unwritten texts, like birds ring-necked and refined. His cries confirm the unbelievable. Two. I count the breaths between bodies, each syllable thrust from the chest, from Salish to English and back, Francis to Clara, Antoine, Otwin, Molly Soupy, through Soupy, Piel, back to Hollix, or Shining Shirt, the medicine person who saw men in long robes, the sign of a cross, saw it all flung into being when, in slurred double whistles on the midwinter cusp of forest and field, a black capped chickadee sang the shadow sounds of his name. But even before that, the forest stood smoldering, apparitions with arms raised towards the sky. You know, and in that poem, I sort of um, consider, uh, I, and I think it's partly because for my PhD, I studied um, the history of federal Indian policy. <laughs> so there was a lot of um, really, really aggressive assimilation um, and acculturation efforts um, contained and implemented by the federal government contained in those federal Indian policies. And, um, you know, so I encountered a lot of stuff that focused just on 
you know, colonial America until the current day and, and issues on our reservations. And so that poem tries to break beyond that and contextualize suffering generally and say, you know, did it, did it start then with, you know, a, a lot of bad things have come as a result of settler colonialism, um, but, but did suffering start then or did it, did it always exist and, and explore those reasons um, for suffering and some of those tribal philosophies about what you can do with it. Um, so this next poem is called Le Chit Chat and it means older sister. And I wrote it for my older sister. She is a wood warbler hatched into madness. She emerged from milky shell, earthen brown blotches, not roar satch, not robin, but warbler. Open mouth swallow of hard chipped notes, calls smothered inside her smoke gray chamber of throat. Disappearing between branches, muted yellow-green tail feathers and body, dainty clawed toes, white lines half circle, her eyes sense but can't see at the center of night, movements, misfire, misreads, the body responds on its own. Um, so the next poem is a dream poem and um, I actually have, I think, five or six dream poems in here. And, um, you know, I have go through periods in my life where I have just really vivid, lucid dreams. And they're always very, very, um, they're, they're, those dreams are really powerful um, in, to me. Um, they, they relay information. Um, they help me figure things out. And, um, but, from all of my life of dreaming, I've only ever had one recurring dream. And I used to have this dream repeatedly um, until I was about eight years old. And then I never had it again. So this is a dream um, poem and it's titled, A Recurring Dream. My sister two or three years old is taken by a man on a camel so out of place as he situates her on, her on his lap, then rides off atop the water. She is too young to mind the distance between us increasing, as I, only six or seven myself, watched panic from the rocky shoreline of our family's favorite campground on the west side of Flathead Lake. The man taking my sister is wearing a coat of many colors, as I imagine Joseph's vertical stripes bright against the backdrop of dark mountains. I need to stop him to save her, but I can't because even without trying, I know I cannot walk on water. Um, so this next poem is one of my favorite ones and it's called Meditations on Blue. And um, it's actually the result of <laughs> just years of writing and having snippets that I really liked and I didn't wanna just get rid of, but they, it, they weren't whole poems. And um, so I, I, I realized that a, a common theme running through a lot of them um, was about blue. So I don't know if you can see that, but it, that became the form is literally, I just pulled these snippets, um, especially the ones that mentioned blue or had to do with this theme and um, made it into the longest poem I think I've ever written just because of this facing. Um, but it's called Meditations on Blue. Open as sky as belief, my son's eyes as a child before they shifted to earth grounded hues of tufted hair grass, golden star moss and devil's club leaves. Six mountain bluebirds frozen in space, but not time with the help of the wild wind. Against the blonde hills, hillside, they appear as if in a still life, as if I could walk up and pluck one from midair. 
fireflies like blue white micro stars blink on off near my father's house on Post Creek. Quickly, they disappear into the dark mouth of night. An emotion described as in she or he is feeling blue. An idiom incapable of posing the questions cried by those it depicts. If crisis truly carries opportunity, what of the recursive nature of loss? Where is the exit from ruin? Because Kwai, the word for blue also describes my concepts of black and green. I attempt to reconcile these differing perspectives held captive in a word. In keen self-awareness of other, i.e. she, i.e. meaning, is the reckoning found inside irreconcilable or the irreconcilable inside found reckoning. Whichever it is, she, i.e. meaning, sometimes enters the mind from the outside, overstepping the insoluble, the wood planked borders between meanings as if. One word or idea was or is more or less active in the mouth, the mind, or in protest or pronoun as if any idea can fit inside the carcass like casket of label. I read that we categorize to create meaning. Therefore, it is possible to change meaning by recategorizing. Meaning hovers, a hummingbird moth, or is it the real thing? Which again is it, Trochilidae or Lahuni, the buzzing long beaked seeker of nectar that never seems to alight? So the, this next poem um, is titled Ode to Polia, Every Mother. And I wrote it um, with, think, with my mom in mind, but also myself as a mother and um, you know, some of my friends who are mothers and uh, just, just mothers generally. Um, Ode to Polia. Oh, Polia is mole. Um, she's the wife of Sin Chetle, Coyote's wife. She's the mother of Horsefly Dress. A mother myself, I find her in pieces of every tight piercing cry of alarm, the sharp shinned hawk precursor to regret for one or more many times over. But I wish to unravel this inherent confusion, this umbilical expectation cordage of dog bane and birthright strung between offspring and mother, twined into the act of birth giving, that seemingly immortalizing ritual wherein the first mother is each one thereafter, passing her blood and being on and on and on. Thus, we sometimes hold our immortal mothers as Arnica, the fragrance of Yarrow, each one the larkspur and lupins of summer, venerations, these lofty projections, expectations to be softness, the safety of nest before feathers or teeth. But none of this will ever do, because how we experience mother frames the first iteration of self frames all that follows. So this next one is called Death as a Lens, and I wrote it about um, a time uh, my dad took my sons and I grouse hunting. Um, really, I think it was just a drive through the woods, but, you know, it was, has like a 22 <laughs> somewhere. And so, you know, I don't, I don't remember if specifically we were hunting grouse or if we just happened to do that. But um, I guess the main, the main point is that, um, you know, a, a grouse was harvested. Um, we planned to eat it for dinner, but my dad um, was showing my sons different pieces of its body and telling them about it. And um, it was such a like striking, um, like intimate uh, 
encounter to see, especially the contents of its craw. Um, it's like holding spot there. You know, it was filled with really fresh leaves still, all kinds of, you know, little, little stone, um, little berries. Nothing was, you know, had begun to be digested yet. And, um, and I just was so struck by seeing the things that it had just been eating and that it, you know, had no idea that it was about, <laughs> you know, to become our dinner. And, um, and it just really triggered um, this uh, memory of, of a prior really formative encounter with this, you know, intimate revelation of somebody's um, sort of a secretive behavior or, um, you know, just what privacy, what people do in private. Um, and when that's revealed, there is this like intimate exposure, an element of that involved. And so this is called death as a lens, expose, to make bare, to uncover, to disclose. A male ruffed grouse lies lifeless, neck, limp, eyelids soft. He would be food and so much more. Crouching so my sons could see, my father slid open the delicate casing of his craw, exposing whole snowberries in perfect whiteness, crisp and toothy emerald nine bark leaves, nestling tiny brown seeds and buffalo berries still crimson red. Seeing the innermost contents of his body revealed his recent unobserved behavior and brought two separate moments of intimate exposure into curious alignment. Nefariousness forced itself when I was a child, witness to human cruelty and whole detachment I had not known existed. Brutality bore down, direct and blatant, so unabashed in its delivery, the sharpest knowing is with one's eyes. So I just have a couple more poems that I'll read. And um, this one is called Une. Um, Une is the response to Lem Lem, sure. Thank you, Une. Um, means it is right, it's good, it's true. Um, so this one is called Une. Which is the real world when language is scaffold for knowing? When can one ever trust what they see with the eyeless words they've been given? Words invert, cling to ceilings, hang like bats, drop mouthfuls of words I cannot open. Unseen archers fire words like rosewood arrows that pierce the airy sky of flesh in a confrontation between past and present knowing that spills injured and dying words across valleys and pages of memory. And so that one um, references uh, basically is a commentary on um, English um, and the worldview that is packaged directly into that language, which um, is, is very much uh, only humans, animals, um, you know, are animate. Uh, other, other elements we find in nature and even in the sky, those things are not. Um, you know, so if we go back, um, you know, which is the real world when language is scaffold for knowing? Um, so I remember there's a poem, I didn't actually read it, but there's a poem in here called the Salish root word for water. And, um, and it, it's a poem that talks about um, when I learned what the Salish word for water was. Um, and so the root word is sal, and the word is sawuku, and um, the word is a verb, <laughs> like many um, words in indigenous languages. 
um, it captures action or a state of being, a state of being alive um, and really part of part of the reality that that our English language does not acknowledge. And um, so that poem was was about that and, and learning. Well, I guess I should finish, go back just a moment and say um, the Salish word for water, sewaku, means to seek. Um, information or permission. Um, in my poem, I was visiting with one of um, a spiritual mentor and she said, you know, it's, it's to make a plea to be worthy. And she was telling me this story about the, the Salish word for water when I asked her about my, all of my dreams about water. And so that was a, um, that was really neat. But that was the time when I realized there's entire worldviews, different views of reality that sometimes conflict and not always, but oftentimes conflict with the worldview that I had crafted as an English speaker. And despite the fact that I grew up on my reservation, you know, I didn't hear a lot of Salish growing up. And so um, part of being exposed to these stories when I was seeking out information about horsefly dress was also exposure to Salish into words and some of those ideas and, and that broader perspective on <laughs> what is actually going on in the universe and in my body and in my mind and all, you know, it was very different. And um, so that poem references all of that. And there's several poems towards the end that talk about that specifically. Um, I think, I'm not sure. Do we have, um, Randy, about 10 more minutes or so? Um, yeah, I think maybe about, maybe about five minutes would give us plenty of time for questions. We're right at about 4.30 now, and maybe can integrate reading more poems into the question. Okay, yeah, sounds and good. And answer period too, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so it sounds like I have time for two more poems. Um, so we'll go ahead and read a poem that's sort of a follow-up to that previous poem. Um, this one is called Baby Out of Cut Open Woman. And it references um, a weather being or an element of the weather that helped to bring about the end of the last ice age. So this is a really, really old story. And um, when it comes to protocol for sharing our stories, you know, we can engage with our stories. There is a storytelling season and it's winter. Um, snow has to be on the ground. And um, so there is snow, some snow, at least where I live, <laughs> there is still snow. Um, but uh, stories that don't reference coyote can be told at any time of the year for our tribe. But this one is called Baby Out of Cut Open Woman, so called because he was squelched to lineage, cut out of the stomach as an infant. Indeed, he survived the unbelievable, a lucky break to become the only living member of his immediate family. Another lucky break, he won his race against the cold birds, earning, a re earning the right to make a law that they could no longer control all the weather, ending the age of ice. Next, he gathered his family's bones, their marrowed ribs, each, I'm sorry, their marrowed limbs, each rib, forearm and finger. Covering them with his blanket, he jumped over four times, bringing them, each one, back to life. These are the stories that belong here, that pushed up through this soil, unfurling as arrow-leafed balsam root leaves, and boulders found in unusual places. How else does a thing enter this world? Now so changed, we struggle to hear the shapes of a language that no longer fits every ear. Each story word fragment moves over hills, the highest reaches of trees without catching in memory. But the crispness of Sinlaki of Kualansutan, like fire, 
crackle, the flick of sound a body remembers. So the, the last reference in Laki is um, the name for Sweat Lodge, and Quillen Sutan is the name for God. And, um, and that, that final bit, that, that last, the second half of the poem um, talks about that these stories, these are the stories that belong here. Um, <laughs> like how relevant is it, relevant is it um, to hear the story of when Moses parted the Red Sea? Um, you know, I just, I felt like I was questioning those types of things and the stories that I had been exposed to primarily growing up as like a church going child and sort of that informing my understanding of why a person suffers um, versus, you know, as a teenager being exposed to, uh, you know, tribal philosophy and sweating and that, you know, prayers being taught to pray in Salish. I mean, those were really powerful experiences for me that helped me really, I mean, it was like a true paradigm shift um, for me. And, and this, that last um, couplet there, the crispness of Sinlaki of Quillen Sutton, like fire crackle, the flick of sound a body remembers. And that references, um, being in the sweat lodge and having something about that experience be so familiar despite the fact that at that time I couldn't understand very much of what was said or even really what was going on but that on some level you know that resonated my body could remember that and um that these these prayers these words these stories have they are rooted right here they are from this place and they are really relevant that can be relevant to everybody um so the last the last poem is called magpies a magpie flock float jumps down the hill from one tree to another bypassing us on the short switchbacks, a game of leapfrog, a winged cacophony of chatter and black, blue, iridescent bodies, their tails, flight feathers, fanned, white wing tips flashing. After three passes, they cut quickly to the bottom, clustering in a stunted sarvasberry bush, tangle of offshoots near its base, hardly large enough to hold them all. My young son dashes towards them, not to capture or frighten, but for glee that of a child, the fun and freedom found in racing towards a treasure. Nevertheless, they disperse. An ellipsis shattered, black-bodied bird dots scatter in all directions, their absence revealing a gift tucked snugly amongst branches, its blue packaging unmistakable, unopened tobacco. We use it to make an offering, an earnest prayer of thanks. Earlier near the hilltop, among so many trailside forget-me-nots, diminutive bright sky blue petals with white starred centers, golden rod iris and storm cloud pupils, eyes nonetheless watching, witness to the omen, of the pygmyel manifesting as the death of pernicious preoccupation and remnant terror, the slow release of bluebirds trapped inside my throat. Thank you uh, so much, Heather. Um, just so yeah. stunning, so, so powerful. Um, we would like to, yeah, thank you. We'd like to welcome those of you who are in attendance today to, if you have questions for Heather, if you would like her to elaborate or, or comment on any of the poems or anything she's mentioned today, to go ahead and put those questions in the chat box. Um, we found that with larger groups like that, the, like this, that's the easiest way to make sure that that the the questions are are heard. Um, so, but so while our audience Heather is thinking of of questions, um, 
and putting them in the chat box. I wanted to ask you, I know that you've been working on this collection for uh, a few years, that you have read some of these poems to different audiences. They've been published in, in some different venues. You've been doing readings since the book has come out, since the collection has come out. What type of response have you had from readers and from audiences? I mean, so it's just so new, but fortunately have had very good responses, positive so far. And um, one of my best friends, um, she's an amazing poet. Um, her book, Corpse Well, actually won the American Book Award in 2013, but she told me, whatever you do, don't read any reviews. <laughs> she said, even the ones people send you because they're glowing, she said, just don't, just don't, don't let, you know, external reception of your work sort of influence you. And um, so I have specifically not, um, you know, looked to see, you know, how my, my work is being received by a broader audience, but people who have felt um, compelled to reach out to me has so far been because um, they found it meaningful. So, <laughs> and also I just saw in the chat that my, I have two sons, their names are Reynolds and Aries, and they just privately messaged me in chat because they're upstairs watching this from the living room. And they said, mom, please, please mention our names. <laughs> so hi Reynolds and Aries. <laughs> well, their names are also mentioned in the poems too, yeah. if I remember correctly, too. Yeah. And in terms of feedback you're receiving from audience in our chat, uh, folks are saying your poems are so uh, beautiful, moving, inspiring. I love the sound and feeling of, of your poems. Um, your voice is so beautiful. Oh, um, in, so terms, nice. <laughs> in terms of a question, um, Carla asks, and I was actually uh, wondering this too, if you'd comment on this, how does Salish because the, the collection incorporates um, and every poem incorporates um, Salish words and, and phrases and, and expressions. And there's a Salish glossary, Salish to English glossary in the, the back of the book. How does Salish offer a portal into your poems that English language can't? Well, you know, I would, I, I would love to answer this, but I would also love to invite Dr. Little Bear um, to respond as well, because I remember hearing him one time, I mean, he's an amazing poet, scholar also, but um, that he thinks in Cheyenne, he writes his poems in Cheyenne to capture what is in his mind and then goes through the translation process. So I would, I would love for Dr. Little Bear, you know, to, to respond also, but I feel like the inclusion of Salish, for me, it grounds the poems in a particular place, in a particular landscape and community, and also um, a spiritual and philosophical tradition that does not exist in English. So um, thank you for that question. And Dr. Little Bear? <laughs> I've, always, I've always thought that writing a poem was so such a private endeavor that uh, I hesitate to talk about them because I started doing this in, uh, in order to save the language for one thing and in order to save some of the nuances of the language and I, I think um, the more I've done this the more English does not measure up to it. And I'm I'm an English major from way back. And I it's hard to explain to a non-Cheyenne speaker what what comes out, what what um, the the product that you that you eventually end up with because there are a lot of rewrites. And it's it's difficult to it's difficult to get that feeling across.
because it's wrapped up in in your I, I first spoke, started speaking Cheyenne before I spoke English. So it's wrapped up in all of my, um, of who I am and um, it, it's, there's a lot of subtlety and a lot of, uh, a lot of um, the nuances that make a, that make the language like it's looking for a punchline, like it's looking for something to wrap it up. And I try to put that into the English poems when I translate them. So you can see I'm stumbling around because I, I never have to think about these things. It's usually in English that I have to think about, well, is this a correct feeling that I'm trying to get across? And I, I do believe, I, I was in a conversation with another non-speaker of Cheyenne, and I, I told that person that uh, it is very, it's very difficult to get, get across what you're trying to say if you haven't had the same life experiences, like the sweat lodge that she, she talked about, Heather, unless you've actually been there and you've been there ever since you were a young kid. There's a whole meaning wrapped up in it. That uh, whenever I smell cedar, for instance, it takes me right back to um, a sweat lodge, or to or to a sun dance, or to or to what we call a callback ceremony. Those those kind of things. They just I can't, I don't know whether resonate is the, is the right word, but they they bounce around in your brain and they bring back a lot of good memories. Anyhow, I don't wanna take up uh, Heather's time here. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for putting me on the spot, Heather. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> I just like to listen to me a few poems. Well, uh, now we'll put Heather on the spot again with another question uh, from Sunya. Can you discuss the role of memory and autobiography in your poems, specifically as they intertwine with traditional storytelling? Yeah, so as for the first part of that question, I would say um, well, when we're in graduate school, we we were trained to never assume that the speaker of the poem is the author, but in my case, it always is. <laughs> my speaker in every poem is actually me. And um, so I, I feel like my poems are heavily autobiographical. And, um, and so I, I feel like they're telling the story of my experience from my perspective um, and also some tribal stories from my perspective, um, but sort of secondhand through either, you know, the understanding or the eyes of the storyteller that I heard them from, or oftentimes because so many of our stories have been recorded, um, you know, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s through the, through the eyes of an anthropologist or an ethnologist. Um, you know, so there is, there's other, other strains of perspective um, that I think that are laced into those, but for the most part, I would say it's it's my understanding of of the stories and also just my story that I'm telling. And it's kind of more about process, writing process. Drew asks, um, "I'm I'm sure inspiration comes as life happens. How do you capture your inspiration as it happens?" So I have done various things. Uh, I will say, uh, you know, I mostly am inspired to write when I'm outside, when I'm walking, when I'm hiking, when I'm just out outside um, and not like outside walking in front of like butterfly herbs or something, but when I'm out in the woods, like the real outside. And um, 
I'll see something, oftentimes birds or just certain scenes that, um, that inspire a line, just a line of poetry just sort of appears. <laughs> and, um, and I go through phases where I, I'm more open to that, whatever that creativity is. Um, and, you know, and during those times, I will carry around a little notepad, a little teeny tiny one, so that I can capture <laughs> the, those lines, um, you know, when, when they appear, because as you know, they just go away and they might never <laughs> come back. <laughs> but um, in terms of, uh, you know, the process down the road um, if in, the, in the process of developing those lines or those images into poems. Um, for this book especially, you know, I started this book when I was working um, as a policy analyst, um, state tribal policy analyst. And so I had to do a lot of um, outreach to reservations. Um, specifically to inquire about uh, policy issues and issues in the community. And, you know, so there was a lot, um, I guess, in terms of the issues that I, I heard, you know, reported back that were, um, were of most concern, um, you know, was people's mental and behavioral health. You know, we had high um, suicide rates of our youth. You know, there were, things like that. And so that was kind of in my um, psyche, you know, as I was approaching writing these poems. And so I felt very strongly that um, what I wanted to do when telling this story was to, to, to speak to those people, to those youth or, to, you know, to, you know, people in my community, other tribal communities, and just the human community in general to say, you know, you have a place, you belong here. Um, you know, it's, it'll be okay. And, um, you know, part of my process when I was editing and, you know, making these into the final versions of themselves included prayer. So that I would pray that I would hear those things that some audience needed to receive in some capacity. Um, and I think that probably just came from, like I mentioned, just being, being in a space where my job was to inquire about problems. <laughs> you know, it wasn't to like illuminate the beautiful things or, you know, it was, it was really to address, address issues through policy creation and change. And so um, I think that played a role too. So that was a long answer for process, but. <laughs> oh, no, process is important. Um, thank you for, for that. Just, uh, Heather, to give you a sense of some of the responses in the, the chat, Jane said she loved the poem about your sister being carried off on a camel. Uh, Max says that uh, the, the concept of language as a scaffold for knowing the world was a powerful concept. Uh, Kim says that the, the use of nature makes the poem so accessible and, and Sue appreciates your use of Salish language. There's another question um, and I think maybe we'll take that, that question and then maybe if you'll close us with another poem or two, we're getting close to the end of the hour here. Um, the theme of motherhood is strong throughout the collection and, and could you maybe speak to the experience of how motherhood has impacted your your poetry and your work. I feel like I became way more concerned about the state of the world <laughs> after I had kids. And I think that's evident in, in some of the poems, but um, it also made me consider like my role in relationship to my sons. Um, like, was it my job specifically to well, really, what was my job? <laughs> what was my obligation? And I have an enormous extended family. So that obligation is kind of spread out where, you know, my brothers and sisters and my parents can reprimand or dote on my kids in ways that I can't. And so it, it is, you know, it's shared and that is very nice. But, um, you know, it really, 
it made me consider like, what is it to, to parent somebody and how much, <laughs> how much are you responsible for crafting their future? And in what ways do you influence them in a negative or a positive way? And, you know, just all of these types of questions that I did not pay attention to. I had never thought about until I had kids. And, um, you know, I also thought about my mom. I thought a lot about Pulia in the stories. Um, she's in some stories and she's really very elusive, um, you know, as, as a figure in the stories. Um, she sometimes, uh, in tough situations with Sinchetla um, in terms of his treatment of her and, you know, sometimes not. And, um, you know, she's sometimes absent from stories where the entire family is except for her. Um, so the sons are there and, you know, so, so she was elusive, but, you know, I, I was interested in seeing what, what is she doing in these stories and how is her presence or her absence, how does that influence you know, her kids. And I guess it was just a really, really sort of blown open um, questioning or sort of like a shorter search. Of course, as my kids got older and they became like wild and funny and they were running around and, you know, I stopped thinking about that less, but when they were little tiny babies and, you know, they, they didn't move much and they were just there, I really had a lot of time to think about you know, what, <laughs> what it means to be somebody's mother. And in the one poem I write, you know, we can hold our mothers to sort of um, these high standards in terms of we expect them to be safety, um, softness, the safety, of, um, the safety of nest before feathers or teeth but that's, that's not really fair for them. Um, and I was thinking about my own mom and just, you know, all kinds of stuff. So um, yeah, I guess those are just some of my thoughts on motherhood and in the way that it appears as a topic in my writing. Thank you. Um, before you close us out with uh, a final poem, um, there's been some discussion of the chat of where you and how you can get copies of Horsefly Dress. It looks like there's lots of resources there through the University of Arizona Press. The book is available through, the collection is available through various booksellers. Um, and I can, I can tell that um, there's a lot of interest in um, reading these poems and having this collection. Let's go ahead, we're, we're, we're right here at um, getting here at five o'clock. Heather, if you would like to close us with one final poem and then I believe uh, Samantha, our program officer has um, some, some closing words for us. Thank you. Um, and thank you for all the comments and for tuning in. And um, I'll just say one additional location that you can get um, the book from is Fact and Fiction in downtown Missoula or on their website if you want to order it. Um, the last poem I'll read is called A Dream of a Darling Boy. And I wrote it about my dad. And um, I'll just read it. A Dream of a Darling Boy. Is this boy my father? I wondered later upon waking. He was a boy from home that much I could recognize his dark hair, lively eyes, glossy black, a muted smile I could only describe as darling. I am walking with my sister near Dixon, Flathead River to the north, the snow deep, maybe four feet. We visit as we walk on an elevated wooden structure a sidewalk of sorts paralleling the highway. Mid-sentence, I sense someone behind us. Looking back, I see this boy. He appears to be three or four years old. He is bashful, he is shirtless, shoeless, has no jacket, clothed only in a pastel yellow short suit, a romper, thin straps stemming from waistband up over bare shoulders back down to opposite waistband and back. Why is he all alone? 
It is winter. Why is he not properly dressed? And why does he not seem to mind the cold? I wonder as I glance down at his feet, frostbitten, freezer burned flesh, dry and cracking each toe, the whole foot and ankles, eating its way up his small legs. He smiles at me, but keeps a safe distance. This little boy who earlier I described as darling, who on second thought is more accurately described as daring, quitis he dares to be. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for your reading and your thoughts today. I know that everyone has learned so much and has been very engaged. Um, what a wonderful audience that we have. We will, we did, we've made a recording of this and we will share it in our, one of our weekly emails and it will be on our website so people can come back to it. Um, I'm going to drop in the chat here a, a survey for our audience to fill out. If you could let us know what you thought, that's always very helpful to us. That was that was just so amazing. I've got a copy of the book and I'm looking forward to going back to it again. Um, so many people have connected with, with that, with the poetry and with you, Heather. Um, and we are so happy that you could join us.